Good morning, everyone. And uh, let me see if I can get my, my, my screen to share first. That's the first important step. And then I can show you my presentation. Here we go. Well, I'm going to briefly, uh, a bit of a rocket ride here. We've got 10 minutes to sort of drag you from planetary scale stuff. Well, universal, planetary, then to go to very small, then very big again. That's the kind of way it's going to work today. It's interesting, though, we, we often view you know, our, our world through light and certainly visible light. And it helps us even measure some of these vast distances. If you look at the, um, the galaxy here on, on the image, that's that's the Andromeda galaxy. It's interesting that the light from that galaxy took two and a half million years to get to Earth. In fact, human evolution happened in the time it took for that light to get to our planet, which I find quite stunning. But light has played a role throughout our life, and it plays a big role in my life. Then you think of um, early humanity, um, you know, it's basically since the dawn of, of, of time, we've been using light. And, and it's sometimes to access in the darkest reaches of, of our world, to record that was once around us. You know, the, here you can see these beautiful images from Lascaux some 17,000 years ago, where, where people are recording the world around them. And it sort of links us. Um, to our past, to, to our ancestors. Um, I always think it's fun as well when we start trying to translate information in our world. We start by using shadows, um, you know, cast by light, revealing these secrets of this two and a half thousand year old cuneiform tablet. And, and it, 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 this particular passage is always well, a little bit entertaining in some respects, because here King Cyrus, his, his genealogy is, is laid out before you, and it betrays him as a king of kings from a line of kings. Alas, the poor old Nabonidus who he defeated, um, he fares less well in this tablet. So he's sort of, dare I say, it, cast into the shadows by the scribe. But obviously, as we start taking information and translating into new forms, um, the, the advent of, of scrolls and, and writing onto, onto parchment, as we're seeing here. And this is some 800 years ago, um, so it's much closer to the present day. And this document, many of you would have come across. This is, in fact, of course, the Magna Carta, where even King John was brought to account, as it were, by the people, uh, for the people, as it were. So these are very powerful documents that have helped our species translate um, our, our, our economies, our thoughts, our hopes, desires, and so on, recorded on these parchments. And these are often formed into the sort of great libraries in, in bound books that eventually um, store the collective wealth of, of human knowledge and history that form the backbone of many advances from our species. But there's another library, one that offers even deeper knowledge of our planet's past, one that might also offer insight to our future. Now, this is my library. It, it, it holds many untold secrets to sort of lost worlds and forgotten lives and, and is beautifully written in stone. Now here it's, it's illuminated by the sun. Actually, this is the Zollenhofen limestone in Southern Bavaria. And, and these sort of stony volumes are, are packed with the occasional letters and disjointed sentences that belong to this fragmented volume, which is the, the story of life on Earth. Now, our ability to decipher this geological hard drive has taken giant leaps in the past decade, but is enabling us not only to look into the past, but also use this hindsight to help us better predict a challenging future. Now, life has relied upon the sun for a source of energy from the beginning of our time, as it were, and it underpins almost all living systems on Earth. But it is a light that is brighter than 10 billion suns that is permitting us not only to turn over the stony pages of the fossil record, but also shed new light on the processes that were once thought lost in the sands of time. Now, this is, is the diamond light source in the UK. It's one of my favorite places on, on, on earth, as it were. I love these places. Let's flip the lid off to see how it works. These are these big cyclic particle accelerators. And if we go to the beginning of the video here, there we go. We've got the, this is where the, the, the fun begins. A package of electrons is produced in this gun to the left. It gets pushed into this, this booster ring where it's accelerated to relativistic speed. So 
just below the speed of light. And they're using powerful magnets to bend this package of particles. And when they're traveling at these relativistic speeds, they're pushed out into the alpha storage ring and continually bent. They want to move in a straight line, but, but due to these powerful magnets you see here, it's bending this, 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 these particles and they're protesting, giving off energy, energy in the form of light. And this is this incredibly bright light that we can use to study objects, in this case, a beautiful fossil. But it's not just fossils. This is not how we began this research. Like many research, it starts as a, as a little bit tangential. It was manuscripts that they started looking at using this technique. It was only later our team started playing with fossils at this site. It's interesting because you know, here we've got the composer Luigi Cherubini. He was a 19th century composer who had a bit of a temper, a bit of a temper. And uh, a, a contemporary of his said that some maintain his temper was very even because he was always angry. So he's kind of the incredible hulk of people back in, in the 19th century. Here he used India ink or probably carbon black to rub out an aria here on the left. Now, this was after he'd been told one of his operas was far too long. So it's a bit of an anger, a bit of a... Mm. However, you know, the zinc image that the synchrotron helps us reveal the ink used to print the staff lines you can see on the right and a significant amount of potassium and iron in the composer's ink permitted us to see and read the musical score. In fact, let's play it. Oh, here we go. Thankfully, his overprint was not rich in trace metals and it didn't obscure this music. Music that we can now all hear and maybe enjoy, if you like opera that is. But I like dead things, so let's look at my world. Now, what symphonies might be hidden in the chemistry of life? Can information that is not visible to the naked eye survive as diluted traces through deep time and be preserved in fossils? That was our question. Now, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, another synchrotron that our team uses for its experiments, allowed us time to place a rather priceless fossil of a 150 million year old bird Archaeopteryx under the scrutiny of its ultra bright X ray light. Yes, we did hold our breath a bit, but it is non destructive, this technique, I will point out. Thankfully, the curator had to be convinced, though. Um, now, a, a symphony of chemistry lay locked in the embedding geological matrix around our fossil, but also within the bones itself and hitherto unseen soft tissue that persisted as these delicate traces of chemistry within this remarkable fossil. And these sort of beats of chemistry that we see on this um, graph in front of you now, to me is wonderfully exciting because it tells us, to go to good old Jurassic Park, something has survived. And these X-ray, well, the images, these are maps of, of, of chemistry. They're not photographs. And they're depicting the presence and concentration of the element phosphorus. Now, the chemistry beautifully maps out the whole skeleton. This is no surprise, given all bones, including our ours, are rich in this element. But, but the central veins of, of, of delicate feathers from this Jurassic bird are also revealed in phosphorus. Incredible chemical preservation of this fossil that had never been seen by human eyes before. Now, another fossil, this time from Liaoning in China, was also scanned at the Stanford Synchrotron. This is Confucius Ornus Sanctus from the Lower Cretaceous, some 120 million years ago. And it preserves these beautiful dark feather impressions. Or is there more to the fossil than meets the eye? Um, the combined false color image you can see on the left here shows the distribution of copper in red, calcium in blue, zinc in green. This is a scene by, by X-ray light, of course. On the right, we can also scroll through the different energies that excite each element, given each element has its own diagnostic energy, excitation energy. And we start with, uh, I've got the image here of sulfur on the right. I want to use that because you can see the, 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 the red of copper maps onto the yellow of sulfur on, 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 the, on the wings. Is that a surprise? Because, you know, keratin that is one of the dominant materials from feathers is 7% by weight sulfur. So we'd expect to see some there. Now, this is akin to tuning into different radio stations, but, but one that plays a diagnostic tune for each element, uh, permitting us to visually cycle through the distribution of chemistry in our fossil bird. 
It's wonderful. No one had ever seen this before. Um, we deployed the same imaging technique to modern feathers that enabled us to map this intimate relationship between chemistry, in this case, zinc, with melanin pigments that are so important to all life on Earth today. This unseen chemistry permitted us to map the presence of eumelanin pigment for the very first time across whole fossils, enabling new insight to the most dominant pigment used by life on Earth today. Remarkably, as we probed the copper rich pigment in the feathers of our Cretaceous bird, we were able to bring back to life the darker pigment that permits this prehistoric patination to be resolved. But why, why do we have this? The, the, the imaging of extinct birds is no flight of fancy as, as the imaging technique we have developed can also help answer some of the most pressing questions that face the planet today. But in terms of storage of waste, whether it be biological or nuclear waste, you're putting something into the ground. You want to make sure it stays there through deep time. The hindsight the fossil record affords us allows us to create models that can do that. The imaging techniques allow us to map dilute concentrations of chemistry in materials that have not uh, been able to be scanned in this way ever before, such as biological tissues from extant animals subject to pollutants and so on. And we're even now looking at the uptake of trace metals in human brains, working with the, the Manchester Brain Bank, trying to understand better how there might be relationships between different chemistry and, and, and diseases and conditions that impact our own species. But, but what are the planetary scale changes? Can the geological record give us clues to a, a past future planet is the way I think of it. We must never forget that you know, our planet has had a long and dynamic history. It's seen vast continents form and break up, as well as giant oceans open and close, through, you know, all through the depths of time. And this is driving Earth's climate systems, but also the evolution of life. Now, these lost worlds and forgotten lives are still being discovered and deciphered from the geological record, enabling us to map changes in the planet's past. This adding new volumes to life's evolutionary narrative. One such volume we are currently scrutinizing is the dinosaur rich rocks of Jurassic Wyoming. This was a place and time of immense climate and environmental change as the supercontinent of Pangaea had begun to split up some 25 million years earlier. This shift in climate is reflected in the flora and fauna of this chunk of time. Now, our team is collaborating with the Children's Museum of Indianapolis and the Naturalist Biodiversity Center to help unpick the environmental and paleobiological signatures that litter this incredible site, along with, of course, gorgeous dinosaur bones. Um, these multiple disciplines we deploy permit us to pass between worlds. You know, there's, some of these worlds are firmly anchored in the past, but we can reveal them through these imaging technologies in the present. And it's this hindsight that the geological record provides that can enable us to construct a better understanding of what the future might hold for life on Earth. Thank you. <laughs>